What happened to the good old days when we used to ride our bikes, jump off the quarry, or beat that high score at the old arcade? Nothing happened, because those days never existed. Our dreams were always about growing up and leaving. Our hometowns never felt like home. Being a kid was frustrating, confusing, and at times dangerous. So how can there be a loss of innocence when we never lived through innocent times? This is it. All right. I notice you're kind of creating your like narrator voice a little more. A little you know, bit. A little bit. It's getting lower and lower with each each one, you know. Whatever happened to the innocent times, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, eventually when this show, like, grows outside of us and then there's, like, new hosts of movies that changed us, there's going to be, like, the Altoff era, right? Where they're like, oh, I miss when Altoff used to do the synopsis because yeah. he had that voice that was so iconic. Then we're going to get, like, Jacob Sartorius to kind of co us. That's our big, like... Yeah. Well, that's the thing. So where has Jacob Sartorius gone? Yeah. Um... And w- where he has gone is movies that changed us. We brought him in as a host. <laughs> he's gonna be yeah. He's gonna be a host for a movie podcast. Yeah. That'd be pretty sick. If that was his arc, this is he... a weird start to this episode. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to movies that changed us. I'm Alta and I'm Chris. And today we're gonna explore how it changed us. Yeah. And if you're watching this, se- if you're listening to this episode on Spotify or wherever you listen to this podcast, know that you can also watch us at Movies That Changed Us. And if you want to watch this episode a day early, or sometimes even more than a day early, feel free to check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash movies that changed us, where you can also watch our weekly commentary tracks. You know, I just want to set the table here uh, before we get into the episode. I'm clown pilled. The uh, fuck does that mean? What I'm are you on, saying? Uh, I'm on a high with clowns. Did, you thought of that shit well before you <laughs> recorded it. You sat there thinking about it last night. Like, oh, I got a, th- got a podcast <laughs> thing to say. I'm clown pilled. <laughs> well, I just. Where are you going with this? Last night, I went to the theaters. I went to visit the agent of chaos himself, Joker, uh, and I saw Joker Folly Ado. Mm-hmm. Um, I t- haven't seen yet. And I haven't seen it, so I won't spoil the movie for you. And I won't spoil the movie for people who maybe want to watch the movie, but. I was like, I gotta see what the twisted mind of Todd Phillips came up with. And mostly because, I, you know, I've heard all the bad criticisms about it. And I was just curious. And nothing else to do. One saw it, and I texted you afterwards. And I was like, this... I, hate, I feel like an idiot saying this, but I kind of liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the only person I've heard say they liked it. Which I'm not, I'm not trying to single you out as like, you, you have bad taste at all. You know? I'm just fascinated by that. I think the reason I did was because I liked the first Joker when it came out, but it left a bad taste in my mouth afterwards, not only because of the conversation surrounding it. Honestly, I didn't really care much for... That didn't affect my opinion of the movie. I think I just had this feeling about the movie that I think you did about the first one, that it was like, oh, well, it's literally just like Taxi Driver. Mm -hmm. It's not really doing anything that's on its own. It's copying that structure. Yeah, it's what Tarantino said. You know, I kind of agree. Yeah, and... This movie definitely feels like it has an identity of its own. It is weirder with the musical sequences and all that stuff. And also uh, is kind of commenting on the fans of the first movie. Like the whole incel thing that surrounded the first movie. It's very much about that. Gotcha. Um, And it's a downer of a movie. It just like at least is a gross feeling after you exit out of it. And... It was kind of like the weirdest sequel I've ever seen. Like it was yeah, so, cool. it, it was so much more interesting than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, there's definitely stuff about it that does just not work, where it's kind of messy at times. But I, I walked out of it being like, yeah, no, I don't think this movie's like sucks by any means. I don't think it's like terrible. It is not fun to watch. I don't think I'd watch it again. But it was like an interesting thing. Gotcha. You okay. Know? Cool. 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 And, like, like the first one, Walking Phoenix is amazing in it. Like, such a great performance. Lady Gaga's character is, like, a non-character. Like, they don't really give her much to do. So it's kind of interesting <laughs> that she's in this movie. And it was, like, a, such a thing that Lady Gaga's gonna play Harley Quinn. Yeah, yeah. Like, the movie kind of just hates the idea of fan fiction at all. Gotcha. Okay, so it's it's essentially, yeah, it's a commentary about the response to the first one. Yeah. And it was just interesting. Like, I walked out of that movie, had those feelings, and be like, it's kind of funny that I'm talking about uh, it tomorrow. <laughs> like, so I had it in my mind. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm just like, I got I got a drug that is clowns, you know? <laughs> Can't get enough them clowns. Like, those twisted clowns. What are they going to get those up to? spooky clowns. Uh, yeah. Now we're just quoting Red Letter Media. Yeah, exactly. Spooky clowns scare me. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, are you are you going to see Joker Folly Ado? 
a prob. I don't know. I haven't decided yet, to be honest. You're probably not going to see it in theaters. I'm assuming. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I'd be surprised if you're like, dude, me and my girlfriend, we're checking Folly Do. Huh? I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, I'm going out of town this weekend. You never know if someone invites me or something like that, you know? I'm really curious of what you would think. Yeah. So if you do go see it, the next podcast we, we record after you see it, that's how we're going to open the show. I have to throw show. my take in. I need, to, I need to know what you think. <laughs> all right. All right. Because I told Chris <laughs> that I liked it, but I saved like what I exactly thought about it for this episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Um, what a weird way to start this episode. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, like, it's weird to talk about this movie as, like, a movie that changed us. Because I'm going to be frank. It, chapter one, didn't really change me. Mm -hmm. But this was the first movie you and I saw together in theaters. Yeah, yeah. I think that's important to bring up. Yeah, I know. You say it like it's our first date or something, you know. Um, But it was, yeah, back in 2017. You and I were, you know, uh, fresh friends. It can't be understated how big of a movie this was. Yeah. Like... I looked it up, made $700 million. Yeah. I knew it was a hit, but I didn't know it was like a full-on blockbuster. It was like one of the highest grossing R-rated movies at the time. And like horror movies, of course, uh, they'll do well, but not like this. Yeah. Um, and I remember there was a lot of hype surrounding this movie. You are someone that kind of grew up with it in a way, yeah. with the book. Very the, much, yeah. Some of the Tim Curry stuff. And so you were definitely more excited than I was. I was going into it being like, oh, well... I'm just familiar with Pennywise as an idea. I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And then you and I saw it. We both really liked it at first. And so we thought it'd be interesting to do this episode mostly just to talk about you. Like, you and your relationship with it. Yeah, yeah, and just kind of how we look at it over time and kind of a, from a broader perspective, you know. Like, we're we're focusing primarily on this first movie, but we're also kind of... You know, you can't not talk about the first movie without acknowledging what came before it and then what it led to. Yeah, we're going to be d- discussing the book, which you've read. We're going to be discussing some of the Tim Curry stuff. Mm-hmm. We're also going to be talking a little bit about chapter one and two. Yeah. Like, we just want to take this opportunity to talk about it in general. Yeah. Um, And maybe Stephen King in general, too. But I want to start there. How old were you when you read the book? 13. 13. And, okay. Yeah. Um, the, it was the beast, the beast, the book is a beast to read. You know, you already know. It's like 1,100 pages long, and um, it took... 1,100 even... pages? It's 1,100 pages. You didn't know that? Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, how long did you think it was? I knew it was one of his longer books. Yeah. I knew... I th- but I thought it was like 700 or something like no, that. No, I think his longest is like The Stand or okay. something like that, but this is one of his longest. Yeah. It's 1,100 pages, and make no mistake, those pages are dense. Like, if you open it, it's like small lettering, too. Wow. You know, every... Yeah, it's, it's a beast. So you read it when you were 13. Yeah. What drew you to it? I mean, I've heard of it for a while. Like I saw, I had friends that watched the Tim Curry version in elementary school and told me about it. And I also saw the DVD at, you know, Blockbuster and stuff. Have you seen the cover to the Tim Curry version where he's like coming out of the corner Mm -hmm. with the scary hand? Yeah. I was always fascinated by it just because, you know, little kids are like, ooh, that's scary. Well, that was a big part of the Blockbuster uh, or video rental experience of Mm -hmm. like, even if you didn't rent out the movie, it was just... We all stared at covers. You could spend hours just like looking through covers. Yeah. And you discover movies or maybe not even see them, but remember the cover for them a lot. Exactly. Yeah. So Um, I have that with it for sure. Right. And um, I think... I read Carrie first. Originally, I think that was my first Stephen King book. If I we talked correct. about this on our Carrie podcast. Yeah. And um, eventually I just wanted to read it because it was like the scary clown one that was popular. You and know, I just knew that one. Did you read the book before you watched the Tim Curry show or miniseries? I was trying. I kind of ended up doing both. I was trying to read it first. And then this is okay. So this was in an era when people got away with posting full movies on YouTube. Like, I kind missed of that era. Discreetly. Have you seen where they broke it apart into like 10 minute increments? What about this movie, part one, this movie, part two? I used to, I mean, as much as I'm a guy who like buys physical media, yeah. so, like doesn't try to pirate movies at all. I was that kid that would be like, okay, uh, Jumanji part one out of 15. <laughs> exactly. yeah, yeah. So I, I was kind of doing that with it where I would read a little chunk of the book and then it would switch to the movie. Like, oh, how did they do this scene? And then stop before it goes past where I'm at in the book. You know? Oh, so you were like doing like a read and watch along. Exactly. Yeah, it was kind of a pseudo whatever you want to call it. Yeah, like you said, read and watch along. So I... I'm very nostalgic over it. You know, I really liked the book as a kid. I don't know how it hold up. And I'm very, I would like to read it again as an adult because I feel like the experience would be completely different because a lot of what it is about is the way your childhood stays with you as an adult and like the things that form 
who you are, the fears you have kind of become your identity in a lot of ways when you're older. Yeah. And so I'm fascinated to read it now from the lens of being an adult reading it. You know what I'm saying? Because when I was a kid, you know, I was like, or like slightly older than the actual kids in the book. So I was kind of with that storyline. It chapter one, 2017 was my first exposure to any of the material. So obviously I'd heard of Pennywise like you at Blockbuster, I would see that cover. <laughs> so I was familiar that there was this like Tim Curry version that people were like, Oh yeah, it was, it was pretty good. But like the childhood parts are the best. The adult versions are so, so, so I always heard like everything surrounding it. And, um, but chapter one was my like first experience with it. And Stephen, like I mentioned this a little bit in my the Halloween episode that we did, but I think listeners and viewers probably know that horror wasn't my thing until recently. Yeah. So it wasn't like I was even curious about reading Stephen King. I was like, okay, well, that's horror books. I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> um, and funny enough, the first Stephen King book I ever read, I don't think I told you about this, was Cell. Oh, okay. No, you Isn't didn't Isn't that weird? That. Like yeah. in middle school it was in the library and i just picked up cell and i'm like i've always heard of this author let me just read this and uh the read it halfway through and the book kind of scared me <laughs> yeah and even though now i hear cell is considered like like his lesser books it's like an okay stephen king book but um that's the only experience i had with stephen king up till that point and i really liked chapter one i really liked the kids in it I thought they were all well casted, and I thought Bill Skarsgård as Pennywise was like a transformative performance. I thought he was amazing. And it's interesting that I rewatched this now for the first time since I saw it in 2017. I had never rewatched it. I'd seen clips from it. And now watching it, it kind of feels like the most cliche horror movie I've ever seen, mm. where every scare is a jump scare. Uh, every time the clown appears until like the second half feels like a bang music cue crashes into the camera and then it cuts to the next scene um and even though i still like the performances and i can still see they're tackling similar themes that i do respect uh it didn't i didn't really respond to this movie as much as i did when i first saw it what made it different do you think do you think it was like the hype of being in theaters when you first saw it of a kind of the shared because this movie because i get what you're saying because i'm kind of with you on that like i think it's very i consider it kind of like a like a uh it's weird to call it this, but almost like bubblegum horror. You know what I'm saying? Where it's a kind of fun that's, that's surface how I level. Look at it too. Yeah, where it's like blockbuster horror, you know, where it's not like it doesn't feel like it's really trying to scare you. It's more just trying to like be like, ooh, like I don't know how to describe what it. What are feels, some what are some other like bubblegum horror? Um, I think like so, like a lot of Blumhouse movies are like that. Name you know? some like that you like that are just like, okay, well, this is not like scary, scary, but it's sure. like I still find it entertaining. Yeah. Um I mean I guess you know. I mean, this this isn't re this isn't Blumhouse, but like the Friday the Thirteenth movies or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Are there any modern movies you consider that way? Though? Not at the top of my head. I can't think of them now. Because I'm I'm trying to think too. I think the 2017 Halloween, funny enough, is mm. that that way. 18 actually. 20, is it 18? 18? Yeah. Get the it right, dude. I'm so sorry. How do you know that? Because I just know. What do you mean? How do you? Well, you know all sorts of tiny little pieces of trivia. <laughs> it's just weird to be like not seventeen, eighteen. Yeah, I also remember specifically because in twenty seventeen we were living in a different place than we were when when we saw when I wanted to see Halloween twenty eighteen. Yeah, uh, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah. So the twenty eighteen like uh, Halloween is kind of like that to me, where I'm like, it doesn't get in my bones, but I found it entertaining. Sure. But it chapter one specifically. I'm going to just call it it. I'm not going to say chapter one over and over again. Yeah. But yeah. it it felt like when I saw it in theaters, it worked so well. And when you see it at home, just those jump scares in general don't are not effective at home. Mm -hmm. They're just honestly like a tired trope anyways. But when you're in a theater with a packed audience and Pennywise jumps through that projector, like there's nothing more exciting. It's like a roller coaster ride horror movie. That's I think that's the closest we can think of. For some reason, when I saw it, I was like, oh, I, I think this was only effective when I had a bunch of people around me. The jokes landed better. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to shit on this movie the entire time, but I just want to just lay that up front. Yeah, you have some problems with it, for sure. And I, yeah. I, I actually have, you know, some criticisms, criticisms of this movie, too. And, um, but, you know, it's very interesting because... I told you this off mic, but there's a video essay that made the comparison of the Steve Jobs movie to the original 
book that it's based off of. Yeah, they, you relayed this to me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, they call it an impressionist painting, not a photograph, where it's not a literal beat for beat adaptation of the book, but it's kind of a broad strokes idea. Sorry, you're talking about it now. You're not. You're not talking about Steve Jobs. No, I'm talking about Steve, Steve Jobs. It is based off a book that was like a biography. Sh- sure. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I don't. Yeah. Yeah. But it's an impressionist painting on Steve Jobs' life. You get what yes. I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, and not a literal photograph of his life. And I think. It is kind of like that for this version. And all the set pieces are really well staged. Like that scene that you talked about, about the kid in the sewer with like the little like him lighting the lighter. That's a really like good looking, well staged sequence. Obviously, the main Georgie scene is like really well done, in my opinion. I Mm -hmm. really like it. A lot of the reasons I had problems with this movie is like the set pieces were so exciting. And then they would just end the same way each time Mm -hmm. when the clown shaking his head, going to the camera. Then it would just cut to establishing shot of the next scene. And so I never really felt like I was like living in it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it's interesting because like the whole point is that Pennywise is a creature that feeds off of fear. Obviously, that's his whole thing. So like he intentionally lets his victims live at times because he's like, I'm building up the fear. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's going to taste better. You know, in the book, he describes it as marinating the meat, essentially. Yeah. You know, and so I think when they end the same, like in a movie adaptation, it just feels awkward to kind of just, oh, and then he gets away, you know? (laughs) So... That's let's start here. When you said marinating the meat, I th- yeah. immediately thought of the Georgie scene again. I want to yeah. let's talk start there, and then I have some questions for you mm-hmm. because I think I want to make it clear this uh, it is more important to you as like a franchise in terms of the book series and the movie than it is to me. Yeah. So I want this episode to be more about like how this how it affected you. Yeah. You know. So let let's start with the Georgie scene though. You're a fan of the Tim Curry version. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it has a lot of flaws for sure, and there's a lot that's outdated, but, but I, there I are like things it, I appreciate about it that's very kind of yin and yang of this movie. You talked about how you kind of like the Tim Curry Georgie sequence more than the Scar That specific version. scene, yes. Definitely. I disagree because I watched the first 40 minutes mm-hmm. of the Tim Curry version yesterday. Yeah. For the first time because you were like, you should check it out. Um, And I like it. I actually do want to watch the whole thing. It was three hours. I just didn't have the time for it because I needed to visit the Agent of Chaos. Uh, (laughs) Joker, fully ado. (laughs) I, what I really like about it is it's just like the the drool of it like the tiny things like mm-hmm. him him having a little like drool there or like the, the eyes changing colors too. eyes changing colors i felt like it was a great way to like okay we're gonna have some cgi in this movie we're mm-hmm. gonna update it. he's gonna be more demon like and it was a thing that they did in this movie that i was like oh they probably couldn't do it in the miniseries where they're like the movie shows right away that like we're gonna show the violence mm-hmm. like all the dark stuff, we're not going to hide away from it. The fact that he just rips off, like you see him biting Georgie's arm. And then my favorite shot is that overhead of Georgie crawling away in the blood in the rain. And you see the arm being pulled in. Yeah. The, uh, I, I really enjoyed that. And another reason why I enjoyed that scene is because I felt like I was in it. In a way, like I feel like most of the movie, it's like cutting away rapidly. It's like trying to, you know... Uh, it has this big ensemble piece that it's going back and forth from. But that scene, I was like there. Mm-hmm. So I want to know from you, like, what do you think of the scene? Why do you like the Tim Curry scene more? Yeah, it's not like I directly have a problem with the um, Bill Skarsgård version. I think the problem I have, I guess, and it's funny, I just said I don't have a problem. But the, the main difference to me that makes the Tim Curry version superior is it's hard for me to believe that Georgie would even remotely give that thing the time of day and not just scream and run for his life of how terrifying that thing is. It's so outwardly creepy. It's like, hello, Georgie. You know, I don't know. There's something about it that just feels very different. And I think Tim Curry's feels something that could actually lure children because he feels more like a person. So I think <laughs> in that sense, because the whole point of the clown appearance is to be easier to lure children. You know I, what I mean? I do think there is... I just like the way that scene is staged as like a horror sequence. Sure. But in terms of believability, that uh, Tim Curry as just like a uh, Tim Curry's interpretation of the character is basically like I'm I'm a 
I'm an adult clown that was hired for a party. Yeah. Like, where yeah. it just, he feels like a person, which is what's scary about him. And Georgie, Georgie is still uneasy around him. You know what I mean? It's not like he just completely is like, oh, look, a clown. Georgie he's is still, like, I gotta go. He's still really nervous and uncomfortable around him. But there's something like, like when it feels like it, he thinks a human is under there. You know what I mean? I don't see the scars guard as like a human. If that makes any sense, which you're not supposed to. I agree with you. I like the little details. Even when he first appears, I like how when you first see his eyes, how they're yellow. And then when he comes out of the darkness, the eyes turn blue. I don't know if you caught that, yeah. you know, I, I like that those little those things I really did like. I also love to on the Skarsgård version how when he seizes Georgie's arm, how like that close up of his face changing. I know when he does that full like, like right before he does it. The bite is what takes me out of it. When when it does a CGI, like, like little bone chomp sound it, that I was like, oh, that looks fake. You know what I mean? Sure. That, 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 that This movie has a lot of that where you're like. Uh, there are some parts where I'm like, I wish there was some level of like practicality involved in yeah. this because uh, there are some CGI that really works for me yeah. and then some that just doesn't. Well, I think Red Letter Media phrased it well, and I don't want to just paraphrase them the whole time, but I really do agree with their, this take, Yeah, um, is they basically said the almost like the film attempted to be scary way too, like it tried way too hard to be scary, like without just letting it be scary, if that makes any sense. Like instead of like... You know, when when she's being pulled into the sink, how it's like, it has to be a geyser of blood. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's it's going for like a really big sequence. Yeah. I think the reason why this movie made so much money is it, it feels like a big Hollywood blockbuster. Yeah. Where it's like every scare is like the biggest thing you've ever seen. Yeah. And so like... If it uh, if Pennywise comes out of a projector, his head's fucking huge. Yeah. If like <laughs> Beverly has like hair stuck in the sewer, and then the the blood comes out, the blood's gonna fill the entire bathroom. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a reason why this movie did so well because it's like going for the biggest thing. It had a lot of money behind it. It's like a Warner Brothers movie, so it's like it's gotta go for it. <laughs> and I think like in theaters that really works. When you're like a, with a packed audience, we went to see it at AMC Burbank, and like it was so much fun. Yeah. But then it wears off when you see it at home. That, exactly. So it's it's interesting to me, you know, like anything. I, I So going off of the Georgia scene when you said you liked that they showed the arm biting off, I remember in theaters before he actually changed and bit his arm, my heart was fucking racing because I was so like on the edge of like how they were going to portray it. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm not going to just constantly compare it to the book, but this is an important scene, so I'm going to bring it up. Sure, yeah. In the book, they don't directly show you know, or they don't describe Pennywise biting his arm off. They talk about like, it's like very vague, almost like he saw Pennywise's face change and what Georgie saw in, in that short moment that Georgie was alive, he went insane. Which is what's reflected a little bit in the Tim Curry version, which is like, you don't see him biting. You just see him come close to the camera with his teeth. Kind exactly. Of you know, so, but it, but it's more about feelings in the book. You know, they don't describe like, you know, and then teeth came out and this horrible thing. They just say his face changed and what Georgie saw in that brief moment made him go insane from yeah, fear. This, and so th this movie doesn't leave anything up to interpretation. Exactly. And so, um, but then a neighbor finds Georgie's body after which they find him without an arm and he's just dead. You know what I mean? So the, then this one's just kind of met in the middle where like, okay, we'll show it because we're on TV or we're on, not on TV and we're in theaters. And so that's the thing overall. I really like about this movie. It, it chapter one. I also, yeah, it just shows it. And it's just very, and it's very openly R rated and gory when it needs to be. The kids curse and they make sex jokes and whatever. Like it's very much like openly an R rated movie. That can be a good transition to what I wanted to get to, which are the themes of this movie. Um, now that we've like given our criticisms about the projects, let's get into like how we feel about these characters. Um, this movie, like I said in my synopsis, in my my take on it when I was watching it. And I was like figuring out what I wanted to talk about is that this movie is kind of like showing you that this like Amblin entertainment view of childhood that we all have of like, man, when we were kids, we used to just like ride our bikes, you know, the Nickelback those days song that you and I always quote, <laughs> which I don't know if anyone else listening is going to get that reference. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just listeners, just go listen to Nickelback's uh, "Those Days." It came out last year, <laughs> so we're not even talking about an old like Nickelback song. We're talking about a song that was new, and you and I just rock out to it. We have a blast <laughs> playing it, even though it's not about our era at all. But, anyways, it's not like. I feel like we all have this view of just, like, the 80s. They were this, like, great time where, like, you know, people used to go to the arcade. The stuff that I said in my synopsis. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this movie's showing you that, but then also has this, like, flip side of just, like, we're showing you 
every gross thing that is happening to these kids these kids are miserable like for instance i wrote i wrote down all the things that like the kids were going through like um eddie's mom Mm -hmm. who is just like feeding her son like these placebo pills to keep him inside beverly's dad obviously extremely sexually abusive yeah um even the bowers kid Mm -hmm. his dad is horrifying you can you understand why he's the way he is um, all these kids are leaving, uh, leading miserable lives in school. Like Beverly has a bunch of shit just thrown out in the bathroom because everyone thinks she's like this, like part of my language, but the school slut. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the bullies are like horribly mean. So I think like watching this movie, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, there were no such things. There's no such thing as a loss of innocence because there was never an innocent time. Yeah, it's like it's like taking away the romanticization of that era. So I wanted to ask you, um, what was your like life in your hometown like? Mm. Do you look back at it fondly? Do you miss your friends from hometown? Like as, uh, like you know, you and I have talked about like your child or whatever. Just as friends, we've talked about it. But I just I feel like I never really hear from you like any sort of nostalgia for your hometown. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess I have some nostalgia for my hometown because I li- I have like two mini hometowns. I have like one town that I lived in from elementary school onward, or like until I finished elementary school. Then after that, I moved somewhere else, and it was middle school up until high school, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so, right, so you kind of had like a fractured childhood a little bit. Yeah, yeah, not in like a bad way, but like, um, but in terms of friends, I have and- different memories from each one, you know. So. Um, elementary school, yeah, I actually do have some fondness for that time. You know, I had, I think I was part of a friend group where we were like kind of the nerds, if that made any sense. And it's funny to say that, you know, because everyone says that on shows like, you know, I was the weird kid, you know, everyone says that about themselves. But I, you know, my friend group was actively bullied by other people and stuff all the time. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, we played like we like role played, played imagination games like way too old. You know, where mm. we'd pretend to, you know, be Star Wars characters or whatever up until I was like 10 or 11. Sure. Uh, when most of the kids were playing little sports and kickball and, do you know, hanging out and all that stuff. Like, we were still playing that stuff. And so a group of people would go come around and make fun of us in sure. the middle of it. And um, I had a uh, quick tangent. Yeah. Uh, I had that similar experience in, like, uh, middle school, like, so around sixth grade. So yeah. I was a little too old to be playing, like, imaginary games with my friends. Sure. And it was like... Us three or four, we were playing like I was a big Harry Potter kid. It's weird yeah. to say now. I mean, yeah. you're wearing a Harry Potter costume, <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, but we used to like pretend like to ha- like have like uh, it was do spells and shit like that. Really yeah. nerdy stuff. Yeah, yeah. And of um, I remember there was like this ex- core memory of mine. <laughs> one of my friends one day during recess didn't want to do it with us because he wanted to play football with the other kids during recess, and that was like a core moment of our friendship. I'm like. Yeah, man. Uh, fucking Jared. He went to go play football. We huh? lost him. Yeah. We lost him. <laughs> Another one bites the dust, you know? Yeah. Um. So I think going back to the movie, though, and how that relates is like, I do feel like my friend group was kind of my own little losers club. You know what I'm saying? Do you look back at it with nostalgia or do you look back at it as a sense of like, damn, man, we really like... It was a tough time. Like, how do you look no, at it now? That that particular time, nostalgia, for sure. You know what I mean? We had a lot of fun and we loved fiction. You know, that's what, like, I, you know, I was always a lover of that stuff. You know, when I was a little kid, we loved playing movie characters or video game characters and yeah. stuff. And middle school, I think, was, yeah, I think everyone looks at middle school as pretty rough. But, like, middle school for me was also particularly rough. I was bullied pretty relentlessly during that time. Middle school is, like, a very mean time. 100%. It's like a, Everyone is mean to each other in middle school. Yeah, and even if, like, you know, we tell ourselves the story of people were mean to me, but I bet even if we, like, really did a hard look at ourselves with a microscope of how we were in middle school... We were probably mean, too. Yes. Absolutely. I agree. And so that's kind of the same thing with me, is that, like, I have fond memories of where I was from. Unlike you, like, I moved around a lot, but by the time I got to, like, age eight or nine, I basically stayed in Knoxville, Tennessee, until uh, I moved to L.A., Mm, which I moved to L.A. seven years ago. So from, like, the age of eight to, like, by the from the age of eight or nine to all the way to 21, I was in one place. So I had a middle school, high school, and college experience, basically, in one town. Hmm. Even in college, it was I went to UT Knox, so it was like I kind of had similar people and friends around me all the time. Even the people in my college, like UT Knox, was a huge school, but a lot of people in my high school ended up going there anyways. So like, I had a similar group of people, but I, 
and I had my core group of friends that I still hang out with, talk to when I go back home. Like still to this day, you mean? Yeah, and yeah. obviously we're not as close as we used to be. You never will be. But I I always have this feeling that I didn't never really truly found myself until I moved here. Sure. So like it's almost as if though like that guy in Knoxville was a different person. And it, I'm not saying that like I'm a better or worse person, but I just felt like I truly found my identity when I moved here. Well, that that's what's interesting about it too because like I think one fundamental problem I have, we kind of touched on this off mic a little bit, but one fundamental problem I have with um, the first movie is how much it disregards the second, you know, all the adult stuff because they're supposed to kind of go together. And, and this one, they were like, we're going to make the first one kid, second one adult. Yeah, which I understand for like pacing sake. I understand, you know, you, it's hard to split two movies that are kind of out of chronological order, but it's way too long to, you know, make it into one movie. So I get it at face value. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And everyone, I think a lot of people have said this, but it would just, to really have a true, you know, portrayal of that story, it would be like through a miniseries of some sort. Well, okay. I'm glad you said that because like, that's what I was thinking of yeah. is I never say this, but could this movie just have been a miniseries? I think it would have been better. I, yeah. I honestly opinion. hate that conversation because I'm always the type of person that'd be like, why wasn't this just a movie? You win whenever they do shows that are elongated. Yeah. Like yeah. there was a show on Netflix called Nobody Wants This, which is a romantic comedy show with Adrian Brody and uh, Kristen Bell. That was really charming, really good. At least the first few episodes were really solid romantic comedy writing in a way that I haven't seen in a while. And part of me was like, why was this eight episodes? Like, yeah. why? <laughs> Anyways, but... When I was watching this, I was like, man, I would have liked it to like, go back and forth between the kids and the adults because I felt like the point of these movies would have hit harder for me. And um, I felt like we wouldn't have gotten so many scenes that just like felt uh, repetitive where it was like, OK, uh, really bad thing happens with Georgie. We see what these kids' lives are like now. Summer started. Uh, hang out, banter, banter, something scary happens. Banter, banter. They get, all get separated. and They all experience a scare. Banter, banter. Yeah. Then they all have to figure this out. Then they all stop and give up. Bar mitzvah happens. Banter, banter. And then they all go to the haunted house. It feels like it does. It feels so loose and messy mm -hmm. that I'm like, maybe it would have. The, the it would have had a, a, a tighter backbone. The if there themes was the adult of this story. movie just would have hit harder if it was like a miniseries. Yeah, and I think like. The whole thing in the original story is that all of the adults don't remember anything that happened. Which you know? I think is, like, fascinating. Yeah, it's it's supposed to have this kind of weird, like, um, ethereal horror Lovecraftian element to it where it's like, you know, and it's clearly just a metaphor for childhood trauma and trauma blocking the way we just don't really process. But you can also look at it, out, if you take a step back, from a lens of the way we, like you were talking about, the way we distance ourselves from our childhood or who we were when we were innocent or when we were kids. You know what I'm saying? Like, you look back and you're like, man, that was, like, different. It feels like a different era. Like, Chapter 2 does that when it has, like, the adult cast. But the problem is, though, like, I don't really buy that they don't remember it. You don't feel it because you saw everything that happened already. It would have been cool if we were, like, going back and forth from adult to kid and, like, we were piecing it together with yeah. the adults. And so every time they started to piece together stuff, we would go back to the That's kids exactly stuff. what the book is and the, you know, original 1990 movie. I mean, the 1990 is more like a little bit of adults and mostly kids than all adults it's still structured similarly but the book truly is back and forth mm -hmm. like every time you see a new kid set piece it goes back like as if they're just now remembering and piecing it together the most and effective so part of the 1990 tim curry version is like when uh bill gets that call from mike being yeah. like it's back and then he like starts stuttering again yeah and exactly, then it, and then it then it cuts back to the Georgie scene. Exactly, that's what's you, so you get it. Yeah, <laughs> it's honestly the most effective part about that whole thing. It was like it actually got me, and then when it like fades back to his face when he's making the same like gesture, it is actually you feel that. Yeah, and I, it's the same thing with like Beverly, for example, too. Like when you first meet Beverly in the book, she's with a shitty husband. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then when you meet or you get to know her backstory of how her, her relationship with her dad is strained and stuff, you you put it together. You're like, oh, that's why she was that way. You know what I'm saying? It's like different, you know, as opposed to the opposite. So I don't know. It, it's interesting to me because we talked about this off mic just as well shortly before this, that like it, it almost feels like this movie is like almost like a pseudo Kill Bill volume one for me where it feels like, well, it's not like the full thing because the whole point is you're supposed to see how this childhood affected them as adults. In my opinion, that's kind of the point of it. Is and the way hard, we carry that with us, you know. And it's hard for me to look at that as this because uh, I look at this movie as a Kill Bill Volume One because this movie does have a beginning, middle, and end. And unlike Kill Bill, uh, Chapter Two just isn't good. 
Yeah, like it's not a good movie in my opinion. Yeah, I have a lot of problems with Chapter Two. There are things, you know, there are, we don't have to fully, fully get into it, but there are some strengths that Chapter Two has for sure, like the casting. And, yeah, of um, course, the casting's great. And once the chemistry between them like fully kicks in, you know, if they do a really fucking good job of feeling like they're kid versions again, like they're reclaiming that part of themselves. Yeah, and Bill Hader's just fucking amazing. Bill right? Hader's great. Yeah, and, and so is I think James McAvoy is great too. Yeah, and you know, a lot of the cast super think, effective. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, I I. I I want to like get back a little bit to like um, what makes this story so effective. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about the hometown. You want to talk a little bit about Pennywise? Yeah, yeah. As a villain? I mean, shit, yeah. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite right? clown? Pennywise or Joker? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> favorite clown? Uh, Jack Nicholson Joker? Heath Ledger Joker? <laughs> Jared Leto Joker? You can see those t-shirts, right, where it has all the Jokers and then Pennywise looking down on them with like strings like he's controlling them yeah yeah because penny blind so that penny... should be like a fan fiction web series right like you know a, like clown school where it's like all the different you know horror movie clowns working together yeah it just it feels like doesn't so that sound awful first year in la you come up with that web series <laughs> you get an indiegogo campaign to get it going it goes nowhere <laughs> yeah yeah of course you know god bless web series right i love yeah, web series. you gotta try yeah um but got... okay um, why do you think Sorry, I gotta adjust my Waldo beanie. Uh, <laughs> Listeners, uh, check I'll... out the video version if you yeah. <laughs> Um Why do you think Pennywise is effective as a villain? Well, there's a couple things. You know, obviously, just he, he's a frightening looking clown. You know, I was never afraid of clowns. I don't know if you ever I wasn't were either. at any point. I never had a clown thing. Yeah, I never. Uh, yeah, there were people that genuinely hate clowns for sure. It's a pretty common fear. I yeah. thought it was just a fear that I always saw on TV shows. Like, I remember in Fairly Odd Parents, Timmy was afraid of clowns. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, it's, I think what's interesting is obviously thematically, it's really moving and very effective, like you touched on, you know, but, um, if in especially in the book, what made it very iconic is that when you look deeper into its roots and where it came from, what it is, it gets weirder and weirder. Talk a little bit about that. Like I don't, I can't. I mean, my mem- my memory is like a little bit fuzzy. So just like the adults of it, exactly. You know, maybe You've... the book just had that effect on me. But my memory is a little fuzzy. But I read into it a little more that it's it's not a, a demon. It's um it's an alien. It's from another dimension. Essentially. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. It's an alien, essentially, Whoa. that's from another dimension that its arch nemesis is a turtle in space that carries the universe. What? Yeah. No, I'm not. It's something along those lines. And basically, like Stephen King. This feels like a Men in Black, like, story no, I, I, Kind of. Yeah, it is a little. It, it gets pretty, like, cosmic and Lovecraftian. Wow. Where, like, um, Stephen King's books share the same universe. I don't know if you knew that or not, but they make small references to each other all the time. I have heard about this. I've heard Dark Tower does some stuff yeah. with that. Yeah. Stephen King has stuff with the macroverse is what it's called, where it's kind of what it sounds like, just a bigger kind of um, outer dimension that we can't comprehend, essentially. And so it, when it comes to Pennywise, its truest form, we don't know what it is because our minds cannot, like our sure. sensory perception doesn't understand sure. it's it. It's so grand, like our minds, humans can't process exactly. it. Exactly, yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's the closest we can get to it is from It Chapter 2 is the spider, essentially. That's like the closest we can get to understanding it. Yeah, I and, remember the spider being a big deal of like they're doing it. Yeah, exactly, and so um, yeah, so th- there's some weird shit going on when you look deeper into it, and essentially it's an alien that crashed into earth that way hundreds of years ago, or I think even back in the prehistoric age and basically hibernated for a while. And um, so it, it, then it just comes out. So it feeds off of emotions because those are like abstract concepts that the alien can still kind of understand. That's This is insane. It's insane. It really I, is. Like, yeah. I actually just didn't know about that. Yeah. So it's it's so in terms of being an effective villain, yeah, it's a, also a scary clown that feeds off of fear and also becomes like, to me, you know, and I think this is obvious to a lot of people, but the way it shapeshifts is it reveals a lot about your own childhood through showing what you're scared of. Because you can learn a lot about someone from what they're afraid of. Because mm-hmm. a lot of the time people are afraid of things they don't understand. That's what a lot of fear is, is like fear of the unknown. Like if for me, I don't like bees, right? That's like a thing that I still don't like. If I, you, not, you and I both know, if oh, we're yeah. walking around and a bee crosses me, I like instinctively freeze, wait for it. Like I let the bee cross first. Many times I'm like... Oh wow! I, f- I always forget you're afraid of bees, and you'll always yeah. have this like defensive thing yeah. that comes up. You're like, I respect them. I yeah, respect I, them <laughs> exactly, and that's the thing. I do actually like watching bees on video and stuff. That's the funny, weird part. Sure. Of me. 
but I've never, but it probably comes from a place of because I haven't really been around and interacted with bees to get over that fear. I'm going to ask you something and that makes, that brings up a point that brings up a question that I think is relevant. Mm -hmm. And also I feel like it's a part of spooky season. Are you curious about your fears? Like, do you like to like, do you, because the fact that you're still like someone that will like look up bees and like are interested about them. But then like when you see one, you're terrified. That's interesting to me. Like when you, when you're scared of something, are you someone that's like, okay, for me to conquer it, I need to understand it. Or when you're scared of something, do you try to just shut it out? I, you know, I think I, I think you know me that I do kind of look into it a little more we talked about a little bit in the no podcast where i'm not afraid to look into things that i'm uncomfortable with but it doesn't really fix it it doesn't make me conquer it necessarily but is fear conquerable that's another thing that's a good question is like do you think fear is something we can bottle down Mm -hmm. is fear actually conquerable i mean it depends you know what i mean i think people fear is also realistic it's a defense mechanism essentially it's you know your body telling you hey this thing is a threat to you you should probably stay away from it right and I think as humans developed in societal ways, we no longer have to fear bears. We no longer have to fear like things that, you know, actually hurt us. So we, our brains turn it into other things. Well, like I'm afraid of people not liking me. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and so. Whereas like uh, many, many years ago, I bet that wasn't an actual fear. It, well, it comes from a place of like, this is kind of just to go off of that is like, we want to protect each other, right? Like we have clans, we have like our society. If you're alone out in the wild, you're going to die. You need your tribe, right? Well, but here's the thing. When it comes to the bear conversation, yeah, I'm not scared of bears, but that's only because a bear is not in the room with me right now. Yeah. Like, uh, and I'm not like confronting bears every day. So like, that's why I'm not scared of it, but I'm still scared of it. That's yeah. not, that doesn't make it. But a- it's not like an ongoing paranoia you have. So I guess that's my question is that like, I feel like with it, both movies, the book, the series, what I think what that what they're about really is that like it doesn't go away. Mm-hmm. You can lock it down or you learn can to live with it, learn to live with it and learn how to fight it yeah. or maybe live alongside it. But is it I, I can you actually defeat it? Yeah. Like, are you always going to be that person that's going to be scared of that thing, but you've just learned how to live with it? Yeah, I mean, like, what it kind of tackles is how you can conquer your fears through friendship and through support, you know, having your people. But what I find interesting about it is that chapter one ends with this, like, kind of hopeful ending, right? Yeah. Chapter one ends with all these kids holding hands, like, we're going to come back. Mm -hmm. And chapter two, they've all forgotten they all haven't seen each other in so long where they don't even know who's married and who isn't. They haven't seen Ben, so they're all shocked that he's lost all this weight and looks built and everything. So they haven't even kept in touch. And they've all been like, fuck Derry, we're leaving. And when Mike gives that call, they like regrettably return, except Stanley, who commits suicide. Yeah. And so it like it's an interesting thing of like, yeah, friendship can help conquer all. But then like that's the lesson I guess they learned in the first one. And then, then by the second part, they're just like, fuck all of that, man. Yeah. Well, it's also like childhood friendship is a big part of, it's like a different thing, right? It's almost like a different concept than like adult friendship. Mm-hmm. And so when you transition to adulthood, you lose that part of yourself, you know? And so that's, what's kind of sad about it. You know what I'm saying? And that's what kind of what it as a whole story kind of explores is like when you lose that basic kind of, childhood support you know what i mean it's and it, it, stephen king really likes that stuff he explores a lot of that in um stand by me yeah or you know the body is technically the name of the book but still it has the same kind of idea that like the friends you have as a kid you know the, he they literally say it in stand by me in the movie where they say i'll never have friends like i did when i was a kid it's richard dreyfus in the movie who yeah. plays the adult version right yeah yeah it's a beautiful ending right that's a whole I, i'd love to cover that movie in this podcast <laughs> yeah it's amazing um yeah, I think like that's why I was bringing up. I was like, yeah, I feel like I'm a different person, and I feel like I. F- I mean, we're all different people when we grow up, obviously. But I genuinely feel like I found out who I was when I moved to LA, and so. But my friends from hometown, when I was part of that friend group, I felt like I was a different person back then. And I feel like what both chapters deal with really well, and what it in general deals with really well, is that feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's like, you know. I think even the way Pennywise like shapeshifts into their fears, like I said, they're they're all reflections of what 
their own environments created for them. You know, the fact that it transforms into a leper to scare Eddie, who's like a hypochondriac. But he's a hypochondriac because his mom made him one, essentially, because his mom always told him, you're sick, you need to take your medicine. Like you said, he has his placebos. So he wouldn't have had that fear if it wasn't for his mom. And so that's what's interesting about Pennywise as a villain, is that he's like a reflection, almost like he holds the mirror to you, in a way. Like, he, it's like his his scares are personal, you know? You know what other clown is holding a mirror Shut to society? Shut up. <laughs> God. Stop it. I just, you said you look, I saw your face. Like, you got a little excited. Like, oh, I got a zinger I lit for up. You. Yeah, a little bit. No, I agree with you, though. Yeah, like... I don't want to just step on your point. I, I, yeah. I, I or the way it transforms into, obviously, with um, Beverly's, you know, relationship dad. with... Yeah, her dad, but also her relationship with femininity because of her dad i mean her hair literally coming out of the drain yeah and like obviously blood too because she goes and buys um you know a bunch of tampons or pads and then when she goes home her dad looks at him it's like really fucked up and weird you know yeah no i think that's a really normal scene yeah (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, i'm totally comfortable with that scene and then also even at the end when beverly and um bill kiss how she touches his face and smears blood on his face Mm -hmm. you know what i mean there's like there's like this kind of um yeah, like this element of her relationship with being a woman, you know, what it means to her. Yeah, I think um, in general, the points of like the adults, I feel like in this movie, the elder generation in this movie is looked at as people you, that can't be trusted. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's so you're, their home, Derry just feels unsafe throughout. Yeah. It, and it feels like um, the people that are part of the older generation are luring these kids into evil. Of Mike, who doesn't want to shoot that animal. And he's like, come on, just take Dude, it. And, and shoots then, it. And we straight up see it. And Bill's dad being like, Georgie's dead, you know? <laughs> yeah, just straight up stop it. Yeah. And it's like them, uh, them stripping away their innocence, luring them into evil. It's like kind of, it's a very cynical statement that I feel like Stephen King, this movie's yeah. making, it is making, which is just generally like, uh, being a kid you can feel unsafe even around people that you should trust that society has told you that we should trust people that are adults that are raising us well yeah and and the idea of pennywise revealing that in a weird way because these kids are unprotected from it you know what i mean the fact that adults can't see it too they can't see the blood that's all over the wall they can't see what the kids are going through what the next generation's suffering from essentially oh yeah and like Um, people have mentioned like dairy being like a metaphor for like you know modern america in a lot of ways too the way america sweeps under the rug a lot of its fucked up past and a lot of the darkness that's there and they're like look because dairy is such an idealistic kind of quaint little town you know what i mean yeah. it seems very wholesome right on the outside they have the fourth of july parades yeah but none of them give a shit about all the missing kids no there's not no adults that are like openly worried and talking about it that's kind of a that's a very effective part of the movie i felt like in I thought of E.T. a little bit in the way of like, you know how E.T. you don't see adults. Literally, you don't see an adult until like an hour into the movie. Mm. Yeah. Um, besides the mom. That's the mom's the only person. Uh, but they always block out the adults faces or mask them. It's an interesting way to tell the story from the kid's perspective. It's like that Charlie Brown effect. Exactly. This movie kind of does that. I mean, you see adults, but they're always seen in a horrible light. Yeah, they're like, always kind of in their own worlds. There's like that creepy pharmacist. The creepy pharmacist, Henry Bowers' dad, um, obviously... uh, Beverly's dad. Yeah, and I feel like all the adults are kind of despicable in one way or the other. And you never see an adult in the movie that's just like, all right, kids, you got to stay inside, be safe, or like, you know... Yeah, there's no Paul Rudd from Ghostbusters Afterlife (laughs) coming in. (laughs) Great way to describe it. No, there's none of that. And it's like, I never really thought about that until seeing this movie. I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, it's very much... The kids seem like the only people that are genuinely concerned about the people that are missing. Sure, yeah. Or at least that's what the movie's showing Well, because they're missing kids, and they're kids. They're worrying about themselves. Yeah, and it feels like they're on their own, in a way. I like, this is a side note, but I like Richie's joke when they find uh, Betty's shoe. And, you know, it's, like, super freaky. And then he's like, can you believe she's, like, hopping around on one foot? (laughs) My favorite favorite Richie joke is uh, when... I wrote his name down. Uh, What's his name? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. It's Ben. Ben. Um, yeah. I in, fat kid. Yeah. In my in my uh, notes, I wrote Ben fat kid parentheses <laughs> just so I could remember, um, because I'm not as familiar with it. But I remember no. what Ben is telling them about his research that he likes spending time in the library, and he was like, "Yeah, in my research, I found Derry was like an old beaver trapping town." And Richie's like, "It still is. Am I right, boys?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that line's amazing. Finn and Wolfhart's kind of amazing in this. Oh, he's yeah. He he's it's probably it's my favorite Finn Wolfhart performance. 
for sure. I mean, L- I've watched bar, a ton, but <laughs> well, I, yeah, I haven't seen him in a lot to be honest, you know. But you know, here's the thing about Finn Wolfhard. Obviously, this was peak Stranger Things when uh, this movie came out. Um, Stranger Things season two, I think, had just come out. Mm-hmm. Maybe yeah. um, they were kind of parallel to each other, for, right? And for sure. so, like every like. Finn Wolfhard being in this was exciting and he was really funny. But this is the only kind of role outside of Stranger Things where he feels alive in a way. Even Stranger Things, he's kind of a sad sack through the, that series. And I love his all, character was yeah. his character character is his character is like really much the guy who's like, oh, come on or whatever. You know, he's like trying to he's sad whether he misses Eleven or yeah. he's trying to get everyone on board about Eleven. Um, and his other movie roles, he's just like very uninteresting. And yeah. so this is the one role that he has where it feels like he's alive. Yeah, he, and he's like a scene stealer. He feels like a movie star in a yeah. way, where it's like, oh, that kid, he's amazing. Oh, yeah, and I, I think it was such a cool way to, like, adapt Richie, because Richie was, is, like, the funny one. He's nicknamed Trash Mouth in the book the same way. The beep beep Richie thing. Yeah, exactly. I told you about that. They used to say that. They said it once in the movie, in the 2017 movie as, like, a nod to. Pennywise says it. Yeah, beep, exactly. Beep, Richie. But all the, in the original book, all the characters say it to him when he's, like, mouthing off too much. Or, like, beep beep Richie, like, shut the fuck up is kind of what it meant and in also in the book richie was really into impressions that was his thing mm. like he liked to do accents and try to do Which, like little voices. in chapter two they do it they talk well, he about, does yeah. that that's mostly i felt like bill Hader because they knew bill Hader could do a good jabba impression yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they just have him do it so um yeah and i think they had him grow up to be like he becomes a disc jockey and he's the, a stand-up comedian in the 2019 yeah they modernized it a bit and i'm totally cool with that you know it's just interesting yeah but um it was a cool way to you know update him where he's like he's an 80s trash mouth so he has like more kind of uh pop culture quips that was another thing about this movie that i was like so this movie came out in 2017 at the time i was probably the least cynical i ever was as a moviegoer i i, I think time and the different trends have done me in but like <laughs> at the at the time like an idea of like 80s nostalgia oh they're gonna put finn wolfhard from stranger things in there and we're gonna have this like um this very popcorny style stephen king movie felt very exciting yeah and so when you saw in the marquee lethal weapon 2 and batman in the marquee was like oh wow oh there's a beetlejuice poster in his room that's so exciting you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um now 2024 seeing it and after all those tropes have been tired i'm just like come on get over yourself like i'm (laughs) I'm like done with it it's funny though because like i think this is another thing red letter media brought up was like how it's like a cyclical thing because the whole thing is a stranger things borrowed from it originally and stephen king in general well yeah and stephen king in general yeah but it was also another one of those classic stories you know like bunch of group of little kids going on an adventure essentially Yeah, yeah, yeah and um Essentially, though, yeah, that Stranger Things borrowed from it, and then it came back, and then kind of borrowed from Stranger Things at the same time, it, it, and, like aesthetically, because it takes place in the '80s instead of in the book where it takes place in the '50s. Yeah, like I think, like at least the kid portion. Does. Yeah, late '50s, and so um, the modern day story took place in the '80s, and so which makes sense because people seeing this in the theater will be more familiar with that yeah, era. And Stand by Me did the same thing. You right. know, a lot there was. You know, in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of nostalgia for the 50s at the time because it was after the Vietnam War and all that stuff. You know, if you look at American Graffiti, you know, it has the same thing. You know, it's a movie that came out in the 70s, but took place in the 50s. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then Stand By Me, same deal. That You know, technically the modern day was in the 80s. Back to then, the Future, they go back to the 50s. Exactly. Yeah, there, was, yeah. there was a lot of that. And there's kind of a weird, like, kind of cycle happening. Now we're in the 2020s. Now there's a lot of nostalgia for the 80s. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, turn. I'm, I'm interested when we're gonna get to the '90s stuff, and like, yeah. when it's gonna be, the early, <laughs> or when we, you and I get old, and it's like, oh, now they're looking back at early odds. Yeah, I know. I'm like, like, I don't want it, but I'm gonna fall for it. I know we're gonna get old, and we're gonna be like, oh, look, they're doing the, the Holly Pockets. There's already like a lot of like fucking Batman's like Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so, anyways, I just remember that time of seeing it in theaters and just being like, man. You, I just lived in LA for only one year back then. You and I went to see our first movie together in theaters. It was like everything felt just so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember at the end, 
when the movie ended and it showed it and then it showed chapter one. Everyone in the theater was all excited. Ooh. And even I was like, oh, chapter one. So they're going to do chapter two next. Yeah. Now, if a movie did that and it was like, this is just chapter one, I'd be like, come on. Like, yeah. Well, and also <laughs> you're looking at it from a lens, too, of like being unfamiliar with the original source material a lot. You know what I'm saying? Because like for me, I remember when I watched it, I was like, well, yeah, no shit. They're going to do a sequel. I knew, I knew, like, of course they would. Oh, you know yeah, what I'm saying? I was going into the movie, just going into it as a movie. Yeah. And so it's just interesting, though, because like. It's like going off of like the way it kind of has a lot of the tropes of Stranger Things that are tired. It's like it should feel like it. You know what I mean? Like that's just, what it felt like. But it's just the time it came in. Exactly. So it's kind of like a um, it's kind of unfortunate, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it happens. Everything's like there's like you say, everything's cyclical. It's a pendulum. Yeah. There'll be these big trends and then I'll swing back. Yeah. Um. OK, I want to talk. I want to talk about some of my favorite set pieces in this movie. OK, because as much as I've like criticized this movie, there are some sequences that like pretty I, badass. I watched it a couple nights ago. I'm like, OK, this is still rules. Um, Pennywise, in my opinion, is in this movie and even in the Tim Curry one is at his best when he's at his goofiest mm -hmm. um, when he's actually kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> so my favorite sequence in the entire movie is the haunted house sequence. Okay. Yeah. yeah that that part is was pretty fun. So effective because it genuinely feels like Pennywise is fucking with these kids. Like it doesn't even feel like he's straight up trying to kill them. No, not at all. He's it, trying to scare them. He's And it's that thing of like marinating the meat, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, he's creating basically a Halloween Horror Nights haunted house, which is like scary, very scary, not scary at all. The doors. Yeah. In theaters, I remember that rocked, but even at home last the other night, I was like, okay, this still is great. It's a fun sequence, yeah. And it's not scary, but it's just, like, thrilling. Yeah, well, and, like, you know, I think the kids' performances were so good, too, oh, because... Oh, so effective. They are so good. Yeah, They know. genuinely... There's some sequences where I know they're not looking at anything, but it's still so effective. Yeah. But... Anyways, um, what did you feel about this uh, sequence? Uh, watching it now, do you? I still have the same deal. I still have a lot of fun. I also think it's when when you do see Pennywise when he's actually like you know going into Eddie's face and stuff. It's I I agree. Pennywise is at his best when also he doesn't have as much CGI. You know, which I know he unfolds himself, and that part was it really works. fun. That part works, yeah. But then he doesn't really change a whole lot. He's kind of just getting in his face, yelling, and is mocking him and trying to, you know, he's drooling on him and all this stuff. You know why that scene specifically works is because we're living in it. It's yeah. not like it's just he comes out and suddenly cuts to the next sequence. When he's coming out of that fridge and he's like contorting himself, like we're there. Yeah, and. The most effective thing. I just remember the theaters getting goosebumps when this happened. And still the other night it worked on me. Yeah. When it's cutting back and forth from Richie and uh, Bill and uh, Eddie's on the ground and his arm's broken. Pennywise is like eating his arm but then isn't like trying to yeah. scare him. <laughs> it's like my favorite thing. It's so like it's so thrilling. Yeah. But then Richie and Bill is like it's not scary. It's fine. It's not real. It's not real. It's not real. And then they open the door. And then suddenly it cuts back to uh, Pennywise. And then he like looks up and the music does the... Yeah. And Skarsgård's performance is amazing. The way he's moving his eyes. I, yeah. I can't believe it. And then uh, Richie and Bill come in and he's like, this isn't real enough for you, yeah. for, uh, Bill. <laughs> I'm not real enough for you. <laughs> and like the way he like kind of fake cries. Yeah. And he's like, it was real enough for Georgie. Yeah, and starts laughing. <laughs> oh my god, how good is Bill Skarsgård? I feel like yeah. we didn't really compliment his performance, but I just genuinely can't believe it. Yeah, yeah, uh, he, he has such a good physicality about him that, like, it's. I imagine I haven't done it, like had that much makeup on me ever in my life, but I can imagine how difficult it is to immerse yourself and become that while you have all this shit going on. And he like pulls it off. It never feels like a performance that is. Uh, in a weird way, it never feels like he's showing off. Yeah. And even though this is a very showy performance, this is a type of performance that actors like are going up for. I bet. Yeah. Oh, like I want to be Pennywise. They probably love this kind of shit. It's kind of. I don't mean to make this comparison again, but it's kind of like the getting the opportunity to play the Joker, where it's just like, ooh, this is like the big, the theatrical performance. But Bill Skarsgård is like, I know what movie I'm in. I know what character this is. And he had big shoes to fill too. It, you know, because uh, Tim Curry was such an iconic performance. And he has his own take on it, and it works so well. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's truly different. And, like, I remember hearing that the drool was added in afterwards. With the teeth and all that stuff he had going on made him drool. And they, everyone was kind of like, oh, this kind of works. You know? <laughs> it's so effective. Yeah. And I think, like, he adds a different element, like you like you were saying. It, it's its own thing. Where, like, even in the opening Georgia scene, I know I had some criticisms over it. But, like, when... 
George is getting ready to leave. You know how he like gulps it without your boat? Like he was looking at him like someone commented, like he looks at him like a piece of chicken. You know what I mean? Like he had, he's fresh out of hibernation and he's like hungry. Yeah. Then you feel it when he's looking. He's like, no, come on, come on, come on, come here, come here. I gotta no, fucking go eat away. you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he's kind of losing the facade that he's putting on too, where yeah, he's, he's kind of like, at first he's like putting on a good show as a clown and then like as he gets more hungry because he feel like he senses that fear, he's yeah. kind of like, he has trouble holding it together. Exactly, yeah. Which so. is interesting. Like that's a cool take on the character. Um, and this movie is really good at image making. Whether they are able to follow through with them or whether they just cut away randomly, that's up for uh, debate, I guess. Yeah. But it, when you see them, like, for instance, when Mike is getting beat up and it just cuts to fucking Pennywise holding the arm. Yeah, and <laughs> waving at him with it. <laughs> yeah, like it's... Uh, those are great, like, clips, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot... And it's just visually, it's just very, very beautiful. You know, there's a lot of just very nicely composed colors. This movie just has... I think the flaw of this movie is that it has... It feels like a collection of ideas that they put on whiteboard. Which is kind of what the book is. People always joke about that. that Stephen King just threw everything he's got at it. Okay, you know? which is interesting, because you've told me this, and Red Letter Media's talked about this, which is like, yeah. this book feels like it was... It was prime Stephen King fueled by cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it the book feels like he threw everything in there. I mean, there's probably a reason why it's 1,100 pages. Yeah, we haven't touched on it, but you know, you know there's like an infamous scene in the book that's very controversial, right? No. Oh, you don't know about it? Talk okay. about it, yeah. So this is kind of like a, like a trivia thingy that people who read the book like to bring up a lot. Okay. And I might have told you about it, but there's... It's like the Fonzie jumping the shark moment for kinda, Stephen King. <laughs> yeah, this is in only in the book, and you'll hear for obvious reasons why it never made it in either movie. But they all have sex with Beverly. All right. What? Did you know that? You do, Okay, so all I didn't tell you about this. All the kids do? Yes. Yeah, so in the book... All the kids are going in the sewer. Because in the book, uh, Pennywise is like deeper into the sewer. It's not like they just go down a single well and they're there, like in the movie, you know? Um, They have to actually like go and find him. Okay. And they get lost. And the book has a lot more supernatural elements regarding their bond. Like their bond is like, they're is like fueled supernaturally is what makes them defeat it, you know? And it's all a metaphor. But basically though, they get lost and they basically... Something along the lines of, like, the only way they can get through is by, like, you know, bonding. And so, basically, they, I'm going to say, they, they gangbang Beverly, essentially. And what happens next? Like, do they just, like, continue the story? Yeah, then they just continue the story, where it's it's meant to be kind of like a loss of innocence, I, you know, what? type of scene. Yeah. So. Okay, the, um, this book is insane. <laughs> so, I, okay, I didn't know, I didn't know about the turtle overlord. <laughs> I didn't know about this gangbang thing. <laughs> so <laughs> holy shit! Yeah, they talk about it on the half in the bag episode too. They touch on that. Like I think Jay makes a joke where he says like, "Yeah, you know, everyone who's read the book likes to kind of mention, oh, did you know that there's this moment in the book?'" You know? I can't believe I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm surprised I never told you about it. Maybe it just <laughs> never popped up. Yeah, but, holy shit! Yeah, I hate so, to say it because, and it's not because of this reason, you fucking perverts. But uh, I do want to read the book. Yeah. Um. Because of how bad shit crazy it sounds, I'm so curious. Yeah, it gets it it gets pretty wild. Like it gets weirder and weirder. Um, I, I recently read Misery for the first time. Yeah, and that just might be one of my favorite books in general. Like I've seen the movie, <laughs> uh, as you can see. Like Kathy Bates is behind me. Um, <laughs> but. And I always love the movie, but the book is just fucking amazing. And I just wanted to just, I've read the only Stephen King books I've read all the way through are Cell. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't finish Cell. Is Mr. Mercedes and Misery. Got it. Okay. Uh, both okay. of which I loved. And I want to check out more. I have this like dumb goal that I'll probably never reach. I'm like, should I just make it a goal to like read every Stephen King book? Like, every, every single one? Yeah, but... That's a lot of books. I'm probably, not all of them are I'm, as good as the others. Yeah, but should I just do it? Should I just have that Why? completionist? But I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I like these projects in my mind. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. All right, so, uh, yeah, the um, is there any other set piece that, like, really stands out to you? That, like, you... Uh, um, that watching it a couple nights ago, you were like, whoa, this is really well done. In terms of set piece, I, I'm kind of on the same page, honestly, you know? I, I like the... Um, 
I, I'm on the same page. I like the haunted house sequence. That was my favorite, especially when Beverly stabs him in the face and his face is all distorted. I think my favorite is when his uh, hand changed and you see it like rip through the glove. I really like that shot. That was cool. You know, <laughs> watching it again, it's like the all the child drama stuff is more compelling. Yeah, I like the scenes where... Like, the quarry scene, I think, is super effective when they're just all jumping and Beverly comes in and it's just like that little kid boy seek a moment where you're just like, oh, I've never seen a girl like that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> they tackle that really well. So, Chris, I think this is just a question for you this episode. I can't properly answer it because it is not a big deal for me. How did it change you? Well, it was very formative towards what horror could really be for me it, it like that horror could be more than just ghosts and goblins and ghouls which there's a lot of that kind of shit in it obviously ghosts and goblins and ghouls oh my yeah exactly <laughs> but that there's something like emotional and deeply personal about fear and what horror is you know kind of like what i touched on earlier is you can learn a lot about someone through what they're afraid of that there's something very psychological and reflective of that you know and it makes you kind of look at yourself even when i was 13 i was like ooh, if pennywise is real what, what would he do to me you know, you know what I'm saying? And I'd like to read the book again from the lens of an adult so I can kind of place myself in that, you know, in in those shoes of who I was as a kid and how I've changed during that time. Yeah, I, I think in general, like to summarize it is how it made me look at what horror really is, you know, that it's personal. What would Pennywise change into for you? If I were a little kid, I mean, you know, what's funny. Like when I mentioned bees, bees would be a dope set piece for Pennywise. Would you know? <laughs> that would, would that be what it would be for you? Probably. I think I didn't like bees. I also, when I was really young, I was afraid of dogs. Like, really, really young. When I was, like, three or four, you know, I didn't like dogs. Until my family got a dog, and then I loved dogs, mm, you know? I'm telling you, a lot of fear is, like, you know, unknown or things we don't understand or haven't really given the time of day to. <laughs> As a kid, it would probably be some sort of, like, um, I was scared of, uh, not dogs, but I was scared of cats. And it was only because, like, I grew up around dogs because my childhood neighbor he had a lot of dogs, yeah. so I was never scared of them, but uh, I never grew up around cats, and whenever I saw a cat, it would be a stray cat, mm -hmm. and so it would probably be a cat, until recently, in the house I live in now, my roommates had a cat, and that's kind of how I got over it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I know, I, I'm surprised you're revealing, not in a bad way, surprised you're revealing, but I'm like, yeah, we, we've never talked about that, but you had a pretty gnarly phobia of cats to for a while. To the point where five years ago, even, man, like, if, like, you no, and like, I, a year ago, you didn't like cats. I, well, I'm, I, yeah, yeah, I guess I was talking about a specific thing that happened mm. where, like, I remember four or five years ago telling you coming back home, I'm like, dude, I ran across the street because I saw a cat. And you were like, dude, if you got hit by a car because you were running away from a cat, I would kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But. So, uh, yeah, I mean, great episode. You know, honestly, I was kind of cynical about this episode because chapter it, this movie, this 2017, it is not a movie that I like as much as I did when I saw it in theaters. I'm like, I wonder what we're going to talk about. But surprisingly... There's um, a lot to chew on. You there's know? a lot to chew on. Uh, great episode. I want to read more Stephen King. That's what this... this <laughs> What all this amounts to. I just want to read more Stephen King. Sure. What would be, aside from it, what would be another book you think I should read? For Stephen King? I mean, definitely Carrie. Yeah. I think Carrie is just a classic, for sure. Um, Pet Cemetery is pretty fucked up, too. Okay. You know, I, I haven't read a lot of the one-off. I haven't read that much Stephen King. That's a great point to bring up. I remember yeah. when I was really afraid of cats, you would tell me not to read Pet yeah. Cemetery. And now that you're over it, I do feel like you should read it and give it a chance. Okay. Well, hey, in the comments, sound off like what books uh, you guys would recommend <laughs> as well. Yeah. If there's like underrated picks too, uh, because Stephen King has so many books. Yeah. Um, we'd love to know. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much to our patrons for supporting us again and again. We really appreciate it. Last but not least, stay spooky, dudes. Yeah.